Hello, folks, and welcome to another edition of Heavy Hands. I'm your host, as always, Connor Rebush. With me, as always, Phil McKenzie. Good day. Good day to you, sir. And good day to all of those wonderful people out there listening to this show. Very excited, I'm sure, to hear me just shove my co-host's face in his own shit. You know, look what you've Mm -hmm. done, you fool. You drooling buffoon. You thought Alexander Volkanovsky would defend the title for the fifth or sixth time? You idiot. You. I, I don't know why. I, I didn't believe in the power of the glue factory. <laughs> I don't yeah. know why I ever thought Alexander Volkanovsky was good. Yeah, he clearly isn't. He sucks. I mean, did you yeah. see? He got. Did you see what happened? He lost. He got destroyed. <laughs> Meets this, man has, this man is like one and th- one and three in his last four fights. And yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we should just we should just face up to the fact that he was never good. He was never good, you know. Unfortunately, however, I should, I should have admitted that you were right, Connor. Thank you, Phil. Well, okay, all right. Thank you. I appreciate that. And 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 when we both agree, at least that Ilya Tuporia, having beaten Alexander Volkanovsky, is now number one pound for pound and the best featherweight ever. Yes, hundred percent. Because that's how it works. Um, <laughs> even though the guy he beat sucks now. Anyway, I'm glad we got that straightened out. Uh, this has been Heavy Hands. <laughs> you can find us on Twitter. Um, no, uh, really a, uh, UFC 298 happened last weekend on paper. Obviously a very good card, certainly compared to most of the shit they turn out these days. The main card in particular, absolutely stacked with genuinely meaningful and relevant and interesting fights, all well booked. And while you did say just before we started here, Phil, that a lot of the <clears throat> a lot of the results were more or less predictable, the favorites just won. Um, the fights themselves did not feel like one way, one directional predictable fights. They were indeed mm-hmm. well matched, a lot of back and forth action, a lot of big momentum swings. Overall, I would say a very good uh, main card. Not just in paper, on paper, but in actuality, I had a really good time watching these fights. I thought they were all super interesting and tense, and uh, even if they didn't end in the most surprising way possible. And then you have, yeah, the- yeah not one of them was boring. Yeah, uh, and yeah, even yes, as you said, even within those, uh, the way that they all sort of uh, went the way as expected, with the possible exception of the main event, depending on who you are. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, within that, there was lots of interesting things. Yeah, I have no idea what the odds were or a no no feeling of what the general consensus was for the main event. I feel like it was pretty split. Mm-hmm. So certainly couldn't call that result predictable. Um, unless, you know, like me, you knew in advance that Volkanovsky sucks. Yep. Anyway, um, what happened? Volkanovsky got knocked the fuck out by Ilya Tuporia. Um. That's kind of it (laughs) because, and I really appreciated this, Tapori's approach was extremely patient. Yeah. I know he he didn't, he knocked the dude out in the second round of a possible five. That feels like he must have rushed it. He must have, I mean, and he did put on some really intense pressure, but he did not feel the need to back that pressure up with a lot of offense. Which is somewhat similar to how he fought Josh Emmett. Obviously, that was a higher output fight from him, even right from the start. But still, it was a fight where he actually threw, I believe, a lot less than his opponent, who was on the back foot. Uh, Which just goes to show, even though there was very little to indicate this before that Emmett fight, he has reached a level of maturity and poise that frankly makes him if if it weren't for the speed and the uh the l- you know lust for blood that only young men really have you would assume he was like a 35 year old veteran not you know like yeah. he's so calm and really really trusts in what his strategy is 
and does not get put off it easily. And he has no reason to get put off it easily because he's actually technically good enough that he can afford to burn time and not just be losing the fight because of it. Uh, so yeah, a remarkably patient showing from uh, Tapuria in, in this massive step up, and just as impressive a step up as it was uh, when he uh, dismantled Josh Emmett. More impressive. It's Volkanovski for fuck's sake. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the things I was thinking about before this this one uh, this fight is that like a lot of people were super worried about this one. I, I honestly, I wasn't actually uh, like uh, super worried for Volkanovski. Um, well, I know you weren't. You, you know, picked him. There was a lot about the, you know, the struggles of of, of champions to fend off, uh, you know, multiple successive generations of fighters and all this other kind of stuff, and how yeah. it can be, you know, it gets harder and harder once people are coming up with their entire careers, like looking at you as the champion. But one of the things is that like those upsets uh as as they've been kind of structured have rarely come have have always come packaged with what is actually like a genuinely tough style matchup mm-hmm. you know uh jose aldo against someone who could just drown him in pace mm-hmm. uh or uh gsp against someone who he couldn't jab because Hendrix was cheating by putting his wrong mm-hmm. wrong, wrong leg in front, mm-hmm. or uh, John Jones against someone who was big who could counter punch and who had some idea of how to deal with low kicks. Like all of this kind of stuff was uh, all of these people like came at the right time, but they also had the right style matchups. Mm-hmm. So from like my perspective, I was like, am I picking? I cannot pick a front foot heavy. Uh, like orthodox boxer to beat Alexander Volkanovsky. Mm-hmm. That, that's not generally how these things go. People don't lose to the matchups that they can beat. Um, but I was wrong. I think this actually reminded me of the Andre Feely fight uh, against um, against Dan Ige. Because mm, mm. it was definitely a fight where Volkanovsky, I mean, increasingly over like the second round as well, was uh, winning the minutes whilst coming closer and closer to getting knocked out. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is an interesting way of seeing it. I mean, you, you can definitely watch the entire fight knowing where it's going and see that end being manufactured. Mm-hmm. You can see it being built by Ilya Tupuria, but he's not winning. <laughs> he's not. He's not getting crushed. Like I said, he's... This is what worked for him in the Emmett fight as well, and why I wrote about this particular aspect of his of his game last week. If you haven't read that, you should subscribe to the Bloody Elbow Substack and read it now. You can do it for free. Um, I wrote about his uh, positioning, which I know is like this is this is my move, Phil. I don't know if you figured this out. I uh, take mm-hmm. something exciting, you know, fist fighting. And then I say, actually, why this is interesting is this is the most boring thing you've ever heard of. <laughs> That's actually you're actually really impressed by Ilya Taporia because of how he stands. Mm-hmm. And then I try to persuade you over the course of an article or podcast <laughs> episode that that is actually very interesting and not as boring as it sounds. But that is what I was so impressed by in the Emmett fight was again, his ability to be as patient, to let the opponent outwork him, in a sense, without actually getting functionally outworked. And so much of it comes down to just good positioning. He does not... He he knows exactly where his range is. He does not stray into it when he's not ready to deal with the consequences. He has really efficient footwork, so he can enter in and the person can fire back and they will just miss. Um, he, he basically, like, because his positioning is good, he knows how to align himself on his opponent, how to change angles, how to reset. Uh, it makes the task of striking defense really easy. Honestly, like, you watch Tuporia just not getting hit by the people he's fighting in these last two fights in particular, and you're like, why is everyone else, like, 
trying to just go right into the pocket and be like, okay, hit me, and then trying to guess correctly when they could simply like, oh, I'm just going to step back on this angle and oops, like you're not facing me anymore. So good luck. <laughs> you can't hit me. I know he has his his uh, young man's athleticism to to bolster that, but that to me really is the reason he's able to put on these incredibly methodical performances is that he just is not giving anything away for free at all. Very technically sound, and it allows him to be patient and calm and stick to these really quite simple but sophisticated game plans. Um, and yeah, that was absolutely the case in this fight. Volkanovsky was winning by virtue of being more active, but nothing was actually troubling Taporia at all. And you could see Taporia just getting closer and closer with the counters he was looking for. I mean, that was essentially his strategy. Pressure with footwork, find a way of countering the jab mm -hmm. and the low kicks. And that was pretty much what he did. He just worked on those things, worked on understanding those patterns for, yeah, like a round and a half until he found it. Yeah, it was mostly, it was mostly like positional in nature. He was, mm -hmm. uh, what he was looking for for his wins were not like, it uh, wasn't really the strikes he was looking to land. It was the space by Volkanovsky's, uh, yeah. behind Volkanovsky's back. Once he knew Volkanovsky was trapped, that was when he started really going for it. Yeah, that was exactly what I said when it happened too. Like I, I believe my comment was something along the lines of the moment Alex's back hit the fence, it was over. Yeah. Like I that, mean, it happened. Uh, something you know similar happened in round one. As soon as he, yeah, as soon as Volkanovsky backed into the cage, uh, Tapuria very nearly knocked him out then as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there were, there were a couple of near misses and a couple shots that Volkanovsky just managed to survive. They were all in that exact same context. Mm -hmm. um, and that was it. That was the plan. Cut him off, stay close, draw out his kicks and his jabs, and deal with them with the defense, and just methodically corral him to a point where he's going to do that thing where he leans back with his chin in the air, and suddenly it just costs him everything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that is the other thing. This was... Um, uh, a great instance of a challenger exploiting a tendency uh, of a champion that we as viewers and even analysts have sort of come to um, ignore as a troubling tendency because nobody else has been able to exploit it. Yeah. Volkanovsky does that leaning back with his chin in the air all the time, but it just basically it looks – it looks almost like it's like not even a mistake because most people can't punish him for it. Most people are drawing those reactions out of him in exchanges, which they started from like the wrong distance. Uh, so they're already a step behind and he can sort of compromise his position willy nilly and uh, just, you know, be doing it with enough uh, range control that it doesn't matter. That just wasn't the case with a guy who just very calmly, patiently worked his way into range and also worked Volkanovsky into a position from which those habits would be really, really risky. Yeah. Borio simply wasn't accepting exchanges unless he knew that that was a retreat which was not going anywhere. Yeah. Um, what else were you uh, expecting? That I, I recall you were particularly keen on Volkanovsky's kicking game mm -hmm. as an answer to uh, Taporia's jab. That is something Volkanovsky's really good at. What did you What did you think of how that shook out? Uh, I mean, I think it, just in general, it was again, it was sort of broadly working. Volkanovsky was, as the fight went on, landing his low kick and his jab more and more. Mm -hmm. But it was just the fact that, like, every now and again, Tapuria could counter him with a shot, which was much harder. Yeah. Uh, when Tapuria was jabbing with him, or, like, when Volk was skirting to his left, when Tapuria was landing the, like, outside low kick. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, I think I actually, I mean, I scored round one for Tapuria, because I was just like, Your, his, his shots are just much more meaningful when he's landing them. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, like Volkanovski was landing more volume, but I I just didn't think it was it was as, as effective. Um, yeah, and despite the fact that Tapuria was the one pressing and moving forward almost the entire time, um, you have to give him credit for the fact that he wasn't getting hit very clean by almost any of the shots Volkanovski was throwing. Mm-hmm. Again, just doesn't give it away. Doesn't overextend. Doesn't get past his feet. Doesn't give up angles. Doesn't square up. Solid. Solid fighter. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it all it all looked effective. I mean, it's as in it was scoring points in a vacuum. Uh, you know, Volkanovski probably was winning that second round, but then mm-hmm. you know, as I said, it was like the um, like the Feely Ige fight. Is the you, you know you find yourself going, well, Volkanovski just has to do that for. No, just keep doing the pits that he's winning for longer and have a rematch, and mm-hmm. then you're like, yeah, but he is, he's yeah, his when his uh, he's getting low kicked, it's because he's he's skirting away and like it's knocking his legs out from under him, mm-hmm. but he's getting jabbed. It's as a counter to his own jab, and it's clearly like stinging him quite a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was it was a remarkable performance. I mean. It's it was weird because I was I was also thinking that like you know Volkanovski is you know very much not a classic model of a um of a of a great fighter. How um, so? In that he's you know he's kind of short, mm-hmm. uh, yet he's increasingly been like an outside kicker. He's not monstrously durable, which is mm-hmm. the biggest possible, you know, the, the the trait that you simply need for long-term greatness in this sport, really. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, it isn't, it isn't obviously, because you don't need it. <laughs> you had long-term greatness, but, for sure. you know, it's, it's the mo- probably the single most valuable thing to have in MMA is just, is just brute durability. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's one um, of the most common factors across most great fighters. The only one I can think of who doesn't have it, uh, like Volkanovsky is GSP. Mm-hmm. Who, to be fair, may be the greatest fighter of all time, but um, yeah. Otherwise, Anderson, Jones, Cruz, Aldo, uh, Demetrius Johnson—like th- these guys are all super durable in their primes. Super durable. Yeah, I think that's that's obviously like Jones's best. Pretty much, yeah. Physical trait is that there's been many cases where he's been fighting someone like Glover Teixeira or whatever, and he's been backed into the cage and clubbed, and it just hasn't done anything. Yep, but. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the fascinating thing is that, like, Tapuria isn't really... And, you know, it was where Volkanovski came from as well. You know, when he was on the way up, the MMA was much less... Uh, even back then, was, was less... wasn't at the state of diversity in terms of champions that it is now. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, the idea that, like, a Australian wrestler was going to be the the featherweight champion was, was kind of laughable. Yeah. But... You know, and then he gets replaced by the uh, Ilya Tapuria, who is also like he's not he's not tall, he's not he's not stupidly durable. We've seen him badly get hurt up in weight. Yeah, more than once. Um, he's again from a, a an MMA scene that doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily that well known. Um, but yeah, it's just been. It's been a, a kind of strange changing of the guard, but then yeah. again, you also look at Tapuria and you're like, man, this guy, he he really has the potential to run for a long time. He's fucking I mean, he great. Has yeah, a lot of he has a lot of road ahead of him in that kind of the same way that Jones did when he won the belt. I think. Yeah, in that there's a lot of well-known people on the wrong side of their prime. That he's probably going to rack up wins against, assuming yeah. he stays busy enough. Which will be great for him if he uh, is trying to put together a Volkanovsky esque legacy, or or even mm-hmm. better, because he himself, uh, like Jones, is so young. He won the title. Yeah. He's still only what twenty seven. Believe so, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's honestly quite likely. I know this is a crazy thing to say because it's featherweight. And, you know, just one of the deepest and hardest divisions in the sport. But it does, it feels pretty likely to me that Tapuria may have quite a reign 
Because yeah. despite it being featherweight, this is a division which has, since it existed in the UFC, been ruled by one, by like the best guy in the sport, pretty much. Yep. That's basically been the rule at featherweight. Jose Aldo, Max Holloway, Volkanovski, I think, in their respective reigns, were at that time pretty inarguably the best fighter on earth, pound for pound. Mm-hmm. Um. And I, Taporia might, I think he very well may be that. Like, uh, you know, I, I don't want to be all Joe Rogan. Uh, I'm not actually saying, oh, beating Volkanovsky now makes him number one pound for pound and now makes him the greatest. And yeah, as if all these things can just be consumed without any, any loss of nutritional value. But, uh, this did look like a performance, this together with the Emmett fight of that kind of great fighter. Yeah, I mean that's what we were saying last week, right? It was that like there's been so many uh, passing of the torches to people of to fighters of late who you cannot find yourself thinking, but they are going to pass yeah. that torch onto someone else fairly soon. I mean, I thought I heard a bit of a <laughs> perhaps a tiny sneer earlier when you you said that the championship picture is diverse at the moment <laughs> yeah but i mean i mean diverse and like where people come from it's no longer just, oh okay okay i thought um, you were talking about the sort of motley crew nature of the current championship picture where a lot of the people are like nah, not, not that you won't be I mean, here yeah for no, long. i was just i just meant that like you know people are from everywhere now it's not yeah longer, true um brazil and the usa essentially just running the show a very nationally um, diverse and ethnically yeah, yeah. diverse yes but um but yeah, there's a lot of champions out there where you're just like, sure, you can hold the belt for a fight or two, but yeah. you are definitely not going to go be an all-time great. Yeah. Um, and that that's goes for m- most of them at the moment, let's say. But yeah, Tapuria, you know, you could see on the before the fight, you were just like, he is, he could really be the guy. Yeah. And yeah, nothing nothing helps to reinforce that potential outcome than like this fight, as you said. Incredibly mature, patient, ferocious. Um yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Especially because we've seen him build the game that now makes him so impressive. Yeah. Just in the last few years. I mean, you you you, you mentioned that um you might not expect like a a Georgian European, uh, I think born in Germany, now lives in Spain, of course. You might not expect that guy to to be a champion or, or to have his skill set, whatever. I would say if I heard that he had a boxing background, I wouldn't be that surprised by what he's doing. Uh, I'd be impressed that a European boxer managed to learn all the wrestling and grappling because they typically don't, but... um. I'd be like, yeah, of course. They they make good boxers and kickboxers over there. Of course. That's like a, you know. But that's not his background. His background is Greco-Roman wrestling and jiu-jitsu. The boxing game with which he has been so impressively winning all these fights has literally been built before our eyes over the course of the last three or four years only. Yeah. There's another way in which he's a weird mirror to Volkanovsky. True. Or like John Jones, who literally used to watch techniques on YouTube. And we know, mm-hmm. Ilya Tuporia, the man likes to watch Canelo Alvarez. I think it's half of his ideas as a boxer in the cage are like, I want to do Canelo stuff. And he just like made an, made an effort to fully understand why that kind of game works the way it does and has gotten really good at it really, really quickly. Uh, also another comparison to another great fighter like GSP. You would not expect a Canadian karateka to be a long reigning UFC champion either. But by mm-hmm. the time he was ruling the division, uh, ruling welterweight, he did not even resemble a Canadian karateka. He looked like a super clinical wrestle boxer. So, uh, another thing that great fighters do routinely is just sort of improve and be willing to change in often quite dramatic ways in order to, to complete their games, to round out their games. Um, just a couple of the things that caught my eye. 
Uh, in fact, one thing I sort of wanted to clear up based on a comment from last week, um, that uh, you were talking about the low kicks, countering the jab, and I think I did a poor job of uh, making my my counterpoint to that, which was that, uh, well, sometimes you just get hit by the thing you're countering. Um, and I could only express that in, you know, terms of vibes and this man young, that man old. Um, I think a better way to say that, uh, and I already said this in reply to the comment that, that pointed this out, is that uh, low kicks are a very effective way of taking away jabs. They are also an inherently risky way of taking away any kind of punch. Mm -hmm. uh, I would put a low kick counter to the jab in the same category as a check hook counter to the right hand, i.e. maybe not the kind of thing you want to be building your entire game on, Maybe not the kind of thing you want to be going to the well on too often too early because both of them are counters which sort of leave you in the line of fire. They sort of require you to have excellent timing uh, because if the timing is perfect, they completely disrupt the thing you're trying to counter. They absolutely crush it. If the timing is off, you will pay for the fact that you are wide open for the very thing you're trying to deal with. Um, and that is sort of what I was thinking about the low kicks that was to an extent true. I mean, to, to, the, the, the real thing is Taporia just didn't give a lot of low kicks away. Mm -hmm. He kind of just didn't get in range for them. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure he maybe checked a couple, but mostly it was just down to him keeping the pressure on with his footwork. I mean, he did. Sting Volkanovsky with jabs a couple times when he was going for low kicks. So indeed, he he was trying to time the counter, uh, just as Volkanovsky was trying to. You know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, that was the point I wanted to make last week that I don't think I did a very good job of. There are some counters that I would not call first order counters. Uh, they're risky, and that that is one of them. I think we saw a bit of that. Otherwise, just um, I suppose I'll just celebrate the finishing combo for a couple of its details. Um, it was not the first time in the fight that Teporia went for the counter right hand to the body off Volkanovsky's jab, but it was a very clever utilization of that idea. Much of the fight was him trying to find the counter to the jab, mostly with the right hand. And just getting closer and closer, a little, a half inch at a time. Uh, obviously very smart to look for that same counter, but go to the body. Uh, obviously very smart to follow that right hand up to the body with an immediate combination because that shot was effective, but it was the left hook that followed that really put Volkanovsky off balance and, and froze him on his heels. And then Taporia. I was really impressed that he came charging in after Volkanovsky, who uh, did another thing that he has habitually done. He reached out with his lead hand, trying to grab a collar tie, and tried to, like, hockey punch Taporia. Yeah. Clearly expecting a clinch, because why wouldn't he? Taporia was blitzing after him really fast. Taporia, however, sensed that he was perhaps about to get over his feet. I don't think he had yet overextended, but he was barreling forward. He stuck out his own lead hand as a frame, reset his feet, regained his balance, and created the absolute perfect distance for the right hand that ended the fight. So just another indication of his poise and presence in the cage that he's... I mean, I can't tell you how frustrating it is to me <laughs> That <laughs> fighters overextending when they're going for the kill and getting tied up is so common in MMA of all sports. Because, like, if you're trying to knock somebody out, knowing how not to get tied up is even more important than it is in boxing. I think we can agree. You might start losing if you let the guy tie you up It's rather than just it being a stall in the action. Um, And yet it is so common for MMA fighters to overthrow and smother their own work when they're trying to finish. Taporia, once again, 
perfect distance, just a just solid, fundamentally sound uh, behind the ferocious violence that he keeps delivering. So, yep, Could, and that is, and that is his thing. Yep, like that is his. You know, that is his finishing sequence. I think not necessarily that that particular. Um, a particular series of punches, but like that's part of the magic that's making him, that's putting him on this incredible streak, and has led to lots of his finishes. Composer, I think, on Twitter posted just you know, don't let this guy put you up against the fence. Yep. He just has a highlight reel now, because yeah, he's just he's standing in range when people are compromised. His stance is not compromised. He is. And he is ready to swing as hard and as accurately as he possibly can, as opposed yeah. to people who, yeah, will simply, I well, will simply like step forward and throw at the same time, and then end up crashing them right into the clinch, as you said. Yeah, like it, again, it's you know, it's so much of the show is you know just talking shit about MMA fighters as technicians, but when you watch a fighter like Tupuria, you see why because. Being in the corner should be very, very bad. Uh, being trapped there. And yet, how often, Phil, to this day, do we see fighters back their opponent into the corner and then choose to reset and let them out? Mm -hmm. It happens so often. And I think that's why. Like, they're worried. They, they know that overextending, overcommitting is so built in to the way they strike by default that they are going to fall into a clinch and get tied up if they back the guy into the corner yep. far better to get him to commit to a retreating step. And then I can chase him falling over my own feet to my heart's content and I might kill him before he manages to tie me up. But if he's got nowhere to go, he's going to try to tie me up right away. So I'd better let him back out. No. Taporia does it like a boxer does it. You're in the corner. You're in trouble, pal. You can't get away from me <laughs> and I'm going to stay over my feet at punching distance and throw punches at you until one of them knocks you out. Sim simple and savage and, yeah, again, it, it's so against the grain of so much of what we see in the sport that it's hard not to look at this as a possibly the beginning of a, of a, of a legendary reign, of a new great champion. I, I have those, if not expectations, I have those hopes and I think they're, I think they're well founded. Yeah. He's the the most impressive title win we've seen in in, in quite some time. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I think that's all, unless you've got anything more to say on the new featherweight champ. Uh, I think the one thing I would say is that I would... This is really a time for, like, keep busy fights for, for Tapura, if it's all possible. Mm -hmm. One thing I don't want to see is him shelved. Um, yeah, that would be young. Better. I would love to see a kind of John Jones style, you know, just constant activity kind of performance, uh, uh, series of fights for him. I, I, would, I think he sh they should just book him for, with Movsari Fluev as soon as they can. Yeah. Because, um, and admittedly, you know, I can understand that from a promotional perspective, that is risky. Tapuria may not beat Movsari Fluev. I would quite strongly favor him to, but. He might not, and then you've suddenly lost, you know, a, a burgeoning star who's mm -hmm. uh, got the support of Real Madrid and he's, uh, and so on and so forth. But I would just like to see him fight people like that, because Volkanovski needs to take some time off. Yeah. Max Holloway is fighting Justin Gaethje. There is absolutely no way Max, Max Holloway is coming out of that Justin Gaethje fight unscathed, even if he wins it. Seems very uh, unlikely. Yeah. And yeah, there's the there aren't you know that many clear contenders out there, and I would like to see Tapuria fight again soon, and not against Volkanovski. I I I, I fear that it will be Volkanovski. I fear it will be Volkanovski, <laughs> but it will be like a year from now. Yeah, I mean do that. Prob that is probably what will happen if I had to guess. Yep. Uh, yeah, the, the, the Evloa thing is possible, but, you know, obviously I don't know how much this means, uh, changeable as he is, but Dana White was pissed at Evloa for his last fight, even though it was good. Cause I, I guess he, 
I don't know. He was, he demands. Was in, uh, uh, again, on the short list of the weirdest things Dana White's ever said. Yeah, but his feeling about it appeared to be, you know, insufficient blood for Caesar. Uh, That's all. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I thought a very good fight. Both guys comported themselves extremely well. And both guys' stock went up in my eyes, but hey, I guess you wanted to see somebody get fucking pantsed and you didn't, so boo, Mofsar. Um, but yeah, also. Um, so, like, Jones fought Bader, Shogun, Jackson, and Machida in one year. At which, yeah. Unbelievable. And, and also I worry f- that we're gonna get, we're gonna get Tapuria and that he's going to be fighting, like, once every nine months, if that. Yeah. Because the UFC just does not schedule its champions like that anymore. No. But I would just like him to see see him fighting whoever. He's already said something about, you know, he doesn't want to fight the Ortegas and the Holloways and so on and the Rodriguez or whatever of the world. I I just don't mind. Just get this man in there. Get him some fights. Yeah. I mean, because the other thing is, if we're talking about building legacies, obviously that was a very practical uh, nuts and bolts part of Jones's all-time great legacy that he... Uh, you want to talk about going through the three generations of challengers as like the the long term goal of of truly great champions. Great way is to just get the old generation out of there as quickly as possible, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Just shuffle them off, and yeah, it would be cool to see Saporia be like, okay, I'm gonna fight Holloway and Yair and Calvin Cater. Mm-hmm. Get out of here, guys. And then and then throw Movsar in there too as as some new blood, uh, and just make that's the, what that's what Volkanovski basically did. Yeah, make the pretty, division prove itself to him basically by just clearing it out as best he can. I would love to see that, but Vol, Vol, unfortunately for Volkanovski, and this is a thing that happens almost every time to any champion who reigns more than one defense, which is that nobody cares about them, even if they're a champion. And then they finally seem to sort of break through as a star right before they die. Yep. Because it takes time. It takes momentum. It takes, um, you know, according to, to Dr. Patrick Wyman's law of conservation of hype, you got to steal a lot of other people's, uh, stardom in order to build your own. And by the time you've done that sufficiently for people to know who you are and to like you and to want to see you fight, you're 35 years old, and then you die. Yeah. Max Holloway became a star pretty much just in time to lose to Volkanovski. Exactly. And it feels like Volkanovski has become a star. Great pre-fight performance all week. I mean, so charming. He's he's such a likable guy. And you were seeing him everywhere and everybody talking about him more than ever before, and then he dies. And... um. You know, now that Volkanovski has that cred, uh, he's out there asking for an immediate rematch. And the UFC loves those. And I suspect that's what he's going to get. And I, along with many other people, would really like to see him take a tune-up fight. Not like a huge layup, but just fight some guy in the top ten and then come back. But that's just not what people do. And maybe Volkanovski doesn't feel he has time for it, and fair enough, but... I don't really want to see him in a rematch considering how this one played out. Yeah, I mean, I think we're just going to have to watch the... I think we're getting the rematch, whatever. Um, But I would just like him to make sure he takes some time off beforehand. Again, I wouldn't expect much about it to... You know, again, another one of these dynamics that happens over time is that when you have a rematch between the uh, younger more durable, you know, fresher fighter who won the first fight, even with, you know, there's some competitive moments or anything like that, yep. then uh, the rematch just, you know, it it just doesn't go the old guy's way. Holloway I still Aldo. remember, you know, you, you still remember, you know, the Anderson Silver Chris Weidman thing where people, mm-hmm. after their first fight, uh, people came in and they were like, fluke, Anderson's fluke. got this. Yeah. He was playing around too much in the first fight. But he is going to destroy this pretender, and it was it was obviously completely insane. It was just like, did did any of you watch this? Yeah. Um, but uh, 
I, I don't think I've seen that level of coke this time around, to be frank, to be like, uh, which I'm grateful for, I will say. Yeah, more um, most of what I've seen sort of aligns with our desires, which are conflicting, mm-hmm. admittedly, because we want to see Tuporia fight soon. But I think most people agree that, okay, if we're going to get the rematch, don't do it too soon, because yep. it's just going to be a worse version of what we literally just saw. That that's that's the feeling, and it, it seems reasonable to me. Yeah, Holloway Aldo one and two, another great example of that. Like, okay, we get it. <laughs> First fight, yeah, yeah. I get it. I don't need to see yeah. that again. Nothing's going to change. You did not need to see that. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, Ilya Tapuria, possible all time great in the making. Really, uh, just uh, an incredible rise to uh, to uh, to being one of the best looking fighters in the sport. I don't mean his physical appearance. I mean, his game (laughs) is, he is a handsome man, but what I mean is that his, his, his game is just so clean and efficient and effortless looking. I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. he, he just looks like he might be great. He might be really, really great. And I'm excited to see him prove whether or not that is the case. I'm also excited to end this first segment long as they always are for deserving fights like this, but it's time for us to move on to the rest of the UFC 298 main card. Of course, in the co-main event, we had Bobby Knuckles versus Paulo Costa, and we are going to talk about that right after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. We are on to the co-main event, as promised, of UFC 298. Bobby Knuckles, former middleweight champ against former head of hair haver, Paulo Costa. Um, what, uh, what did you think about this one, Phil? Kick us off. Uh, you know, with this one, we basically made the, I think, the logical pick, Mm -hmm. which is that you have to pick that Paulo Costa is going to turn up looking like Shed, Mm -hmm. because he's been, uh, looking bad, and with, uh, very few exceptions, or... Basically, all of his most recent fights hasn't been one where you've been looking at him and seeing, like, oh, oh yeah, this is genuinely good stuff from Paulo Costa. It's been, been from the absolutely apocalyptically awful, aka the Adesanya fight, to the just yeah. barely holding on, which is the Vittori fight, and uh, then the Rockhold fight where, you know, it looked like he was just staring his own declining masculinity in the face. <laughs> yeah. And... Yeah, so I mean, there was, uh, and as we said, you know, this was a this would be a really exciting, really thrilling matchup uh, if Paulo Costa was still turning up to fights anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you know what? He actually turned up. He, he kind of did. Yeah, and I almost, I would almost push back on that slightly. In that, when I was talking about this one with uh, Zane last week, you know, we were having as we do, more or less a different version of the conversation you and I had about the fight. And the more I thought about it, I was like, I don't know that it's really just the Rockhold and the Adesanya fights are the only ones. The The other ones I don't think are that bad of a look for Costa. There's, I guess there's the Romero fight and the Vittori one. For the, the Vittori In one the was... the Romero fight, he looks, he looks really good. Yeah. I mean, admittedly, part of this is just due to Romero not doing anything for huge portions of the fight as is his yeah want. but it also but. simultaneously being the only performance ever where romero has like actually boxed functionally <laughs> and, yeah. it, and it working really well when he started to do that um but yeah i was thinking like the vittori fight was it was such a huge shit show around it 
uh, we had, and, and we, because of that, we ended up having very low expectations for Costa. And I, I do remember him really exceeding them on the night of the fight. He, he looked even like after the first round watching that fight, it was like, Oh, he's gassed. And he really wasn't. He, I thought it was a pretty good performance. He just, you know, it's not a great sign if a, you know, an athletic, powerful, aggressive top fighter can't beat Marvin Vittori. But um, I would call it at, at worst a distracted showing from Paulo Costa and, and not necessarily a bad one. It's really just the Rockhold fight that formed my expectations here because he looks like shit in that fight. He looks terrible. I mean, that's, that's why I said like they're, they're varying shades. Like the Vittori yeah. one is, is the best. The Adesanya one is obviously, you know, yeah. one of the worst bed shittings that anyone's put forward in a title fight. Pretty much. A non-performance. And the Rockhold fight, yeah, is, is, is pretty bad. <laughs> but the Rockhold fight, look, that looks like a fighter in steep decline. Like, he can't put any combinations together. His defense is non-existent. He just looks like he's fumbling his way through that entire fight. And uh, this was a great reminder of just how much you you should be wary of letting singular terrible performances <laughs> inform your whole read on a fighter. Because... I would I would honestly say three pretty bad performances uh, in a row is yeah a hundred percent what you should you should a hundred percent take note of that as a but it was just the raw cold one that people can turn around a worse streaks than that sure like Carol King, Carolina Kovalkiewicz or whatever but or Andre Olovsky for that matter but I would sure I, I totally don't regret like saying. I thought Polo Costa was pretty much done. No, I don't regret it either. But, but it's just it was it was just the Rockhold fight where he looked really like inexplicably bad to me, mm-hmm. and that that is not the the low bar set by those other. Uh, I would agree, not impressive performances, but also, you know, I, I get why he freaked out against Adesanya. I didn't think he did that badly against Vittori, while there was clearly a bunch of other shit going on in his his stupid life. Um, yeah, this looked like the Paulo Costa that we sort of expected to be seeing at this level when he first climbed the, up the division, like aggressive, solid, pretty technical, good lead hand. That was always the book on Paulo Costa, man, this guy's got a jab and a great left hook. And those shots were on point in this fight. The jab in particular was really very effective and he used it quite a bit. Um, so yeah, but despite showing up and looking like, uh, a, a, a quality, uh, well-prepared fighter, he still lost more or less the exact fight that we expected him to lose to Bobby Knuckles. Um, I think he did a good job of sort of, uh, yeah, working his own jab and low kick game obviously has a lot of pop on that. It was just the fact that, uh, Robert Whitaker just has a cleverer game than he does. Yep. Um, you know, his Whitaker's entries are always disguised behind feints, mm-hmm. and they have a number of different things which can come out of them. He's either you know Whitaker has a very deep step in uh for his jab. He's also going to left hook and or right hand uh, slip and right hand counter all of these things have different timings come from different angles his, his step in is also often like a low kick um and yeah he's just he was just much more willing to keep costa guessing whereas get, costa was just like i will he he simply had those two weapons mm-hmm. at moderate at fairly telegraph timings but because he's you know huge and hyper athletic and actually like a genuinely quite good puncher like yeah mechanically sound uh jabber and low kicker like he was giving uh giving Whitaker serious problems um much like um jared cannonier did yeah but simply being Eat and potatoes and focused uh, can can really get you places. But as it, as it was, the the fight was 
mostly Robert Whittaker soundly pulling ahead with the sole yeah. uh, exception of when he got hurt at the end of the first round. Yeah. In a what would have been an absolutely heartbreaking way to lose. <laughs> like, just a stupid, hey, what if I try this strike? Yep. Uh, that, you know, I, I think was a good read. Any kind of head kick there looked like a good idea. Bobby Knuckles, hold that right hand by your chin, buddy. Just keep it there, <laughs> please. <laughs> he just doesn't. He's just got this super relaxed guard and... Yeah, I was going to say one reason I think he was able to pull ahead, one of the big differences between them is that Bobby was just had way more sophisticated defense. Paulo can throw up a guard, and he can pull back. Yes. That's basically what he's got. And that's why, yeah, the jabs and the combinations from Whitaker were just consistently way more effective. Meanwhile, Whitaker is parrying and and creating angles and ducking under shots, and he's got a – a little system of defensive techniques to go to to avoid jabs at the very least. And, um, but Whitaker just refuses to make like a, that kind of like really straightforward defensive adjustment. Like something's working on you. Okay. I'm just going to put my right hand here so that doesn't work anymore. It's just not mm. that kind of fighter. Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, I thought, uh, pretty damn solid showing from Robert Whitaker. I thought he recovered incredibly well from that super scary moment. In fact, there was a uh, footage of him returning to the corner after from the crowd where he actually gets his legs back under him, like right away, like before the rounds even over, he's pretty steady. He walks back to his corner looking fine. I don't know how he did that. It looked like he was really, really badly hurt. Mm hmm. But he pulled himself together and stayed very calm and went straight back to winning the fight he had been winning up to that point. So credit to Bobby Knuckles, real poise and determination there. Um, I mean, this is one of the dynamics that we talked about last week, right? Is that uh, you were saying, like, Whitaker's getting hurt in every single one of his fights. And then we thought about it. We were like... But Whitaker's always gone hard in yeah. every single one of his fights. Yeah, he's basically never been the most durable guy in the world. He's just tough mentally, and he's very crafty and resourceful. He will find ways of, if he manages to recover, which he almost always does, he will find a way of stabilizing and uh, putting the fight back under some kind of control. Yeah, yeah. The, the other thing... Um, about this fight, this was perhaps the the least extreme example of this, but uh, a theme which occurred to me uh, throughout this UFC 298 main card uh, was sort of the, I think, an all too typical MMA specific misunderstanding of the role of footwork and evasion in fights. Uh, you and I know. This is MMA, man who go forward win. Mm. That's that's the sport. The reason for that is because getting chased around is bad. <laughs> the guy coming forward is faster going forward than you are retreating. Um, it typically means giving away a lot of initiative. And, and unless your footwork is really, really sound, it means taking yourself repeatedly out of position to stop the other guy, to dissuade the other guy from full on chasing you. Um, this fight had a bit of that. I thought there was a bit of it in the Volkanovsky fight as well. Both performances where a certain amount of standing one's ground or retreating without retreating. That is to say, pivoting instead of stepping backwards, changing the distance between the guy's hands and your face, not changing the distance between your two bodies. That's what a pivot does. That's why it's so good for evading and then countering immediately. Uh, it leaves you in range, but adjusts your position. That to me is, is the epitome of a stick and move performance. The vast majority of MMA fighters I find when they're thinking stick and move are doing a really broad version of that game plan where they are really like, if anything, encouraging the other guy to chase them 
more intensely, to throw more volume, to find ways of corralling them. And there was a little bit of that here because the best moments of this fight for Robert, Robert Whitaker were when he was pressuring, which he's been really good at basically forever. I mean, I think back when he had the Jacare fight, I was talking about, man, he's so good at fainting. Uh, and when he puts somebody in the back foot, he's so tricky to predict when he is just keeping a hold of the initiative. And he did that for like a minute at a time, two or three times in this fight, and it was so effective, immediately Polo Costa stopped getting anything done. But his corner kept telling him to fight smart. And in MMA, that means run around <laughs> and and take your jab offline and skirt around the cage and let the other guy sort of get the initiative back. I don't like it. Um, we're going to have a lot more occasion to talk about that, that dynamic though in, is it our next fight? Yes, it is. Would you like to talk now before we break segment about Ian Gary versus Jeff Neal? Yeah. This another one where, mm -hmm. go on. The dynamic was not unpredictable in, no, in, you told me Ian Gary won this fight by circling away to his left and countering Neil when he got inside too close. And that's that's it. And he won a fairly a reasonably convincing decision. I'd be like, sure. Mm -hmm. But again, this was not exactly what we were expecting. It was the, mm -hmm. in the broader, broader strokes, it was what you expected. But it wasn't exactly what we thought we would see going in, in part because Gary didn't look very good. Yeah, I was going to say that. It was, in fact, significantly worse than what I was expecting. Um, not as a fight. It was a reasonably... It was okay. It, it was probably the least interesting fight on the main card. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it had the most stalling, the least consequential offense. Um, but particularly for Ian Gary... I, I did not think this was a particularly good, um, consistent performance from him. And a lot of that comes down to the theme of the card. Is backpedaling the same as sticking and moving? And I would say no. <laughs> no, it's not. And this was the the really tragic thing about this is I think I could be misinterpreting this. Maybe, you know, there's a... Private language terms mean different things than what I think from the outside. But Gary's corner more than once told him to do the least effective stuff he kept doing in this fight, which was to just circle, circle, circle endlessly. I mean, it was effective in the sense that Jeff Neal can't cut off the cage and he rarely actually punished Gary for that. Mm -hmm. But it was ineffective in that Gary didn't get shit done when he was doing that because he was not in position because when you are galloping from side to side, yes, you may be forcing the other guy to reset constantly, but you are not doing it with a threat. You're not demanding reactions out of him. Your evasion is in fact giving away the initiative rather than helping you to regain it by constantly threatening from a new angle. I said this, and I'll say it again, well aware of the cataclysmic results that could arise from these two personalities being in the same room together, Ian Gary could actually learn a thing or two from Sean O'Malley, who is mm -hmm. genuinely good at that, who knows how to circle without neutralizing his own boxing game. Ian Gary, uh, I mean, I, I thought he did it better back when he fought Gabe Green, but I think it's because he was more content to fight with his back off the cage, on the cage in that fight. And so he was forced to do smaller, more efficient movements and come up with more counters because he actually just had less room to move around in. In this one, it's almost as if because Jeff Neal was not able to corral him except when he tied him up in a clinch that went nowhere, uh, Gary was able to do long stretches of this utterly ineffective uh, uh, backpedaling footwork. 
I hated it. Honestly, I found it very frustrating to watch. It was not a smart approach. And the frustrating thing is that the corner asked for it. They said, stay smart. And then, but when Gary was standing his ground and not moving that much, he was, I thought, just thought he was so much better, but his corner didn't want him to do it. They didn't think it was the smart way to fight. And I disagree. Yeah, this was definitely the uh, the time when, like, the copying f- the homework really came yeah. back to yeah. haunt Gary, because you could 100% see what he wanted to do. It, you know, you saw he'd seen a couple of people beat, uh, beat Neil before, mm-hmm. and he was like, which is the one that I'm the most like, and who did it the, the cleanest? And the answer to both those things is obviously Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. Mm-hmm. Like, sure, I'm going to be Stephen Wonderboy Thompson. But the the problem is, is that he's not. <laughs> he's like he's not. Uh, Thompson has genuinely good footwork, and is working to create same time counters and sit down. And increasingly nowadays, sit down in the pocket and throw combinations. Mm-hmm. Standing his um, ground, moving his feet efficiently, creating angles, staying in a position of, of threat. Yeah. Stephen Thompson, undeniably, has better footwork than Ian Gary. That is what I thought watching this performance. Oh, Stephen mm-hmm. Thompson actually does this right. He does this well. Yes. He is, uh, he is taking strong and weak angles. He knows what the odds are in each one of them. And yeah, he is looking to create collisions. What I found with this is that like Gary obviously has like a really good both innate and uh an good innate and a good like studied understanding of you know what strikes do and how they go. Mm-hmm. But I think he mostly understands them in in terms of like where his strikes are moving people into, and you know he's not. As I said, he's not Wonder Boy who is constantly moving people, who is constantly looking to use people's movement to pull them into his strikes. Because mm-hmm. what made this so awful was that Gary simply seemed to want Neil to commit to a strike and to miss mm-hmm. so that Gary could then punish him after he'd missed it. He wasn't looking to like create a same time counter or anything like that was mostly just trying to pull Neil on and then waiting for Neil to throw something so that he could like body kick him essentially mm-hmm. uh, which just meant that like if Neil didn't throw anything Gary just kept having to move backwards faster and faster mm-hmm. to try and pull him into actually doing something mm-hmm. and just circle more and more which just ended up with a Neil just following him around in a circle and Gary just waiting for him to miss so that he could start pouring offense on. Mm -hmm. Once Neil did actually get into the pocket, like, as you said, Gary had some answers there. He had that stepping knee. Yeah, the knee was beautiful. uh, His own clinch work. He actually actually got things done. Yeah, he is... He clearly came in with the idea of a counterpunching game in this one, but he's he's not a mobile counterpuncher. Yeah. Well, and it's not... Like, he's incapable of being... It is a technical limitation, the way I see it. It is that you have to keep your jab online while you're evading if you want to be a counterpuncher off the back foot. This is why in MMA there there are so many more people who are good at countering are people who, like, get into exchanges. That's how we know they're good at countering because they stand their ground. It's far rarer to see somebody who can counter while constantly moving because most people, most MMA fighters, when they are forced to move, this is what they do. They gallop, they open up their stance and they hop side to side. And you simply cannot do anything (laughs) from that position. You have to, I mean, you, you can only after setting your feet, you have to telegraph, you have to adjust from that kind of gate before you can be effective again. Uh, and this is why, though it pains me, I I repeatedly praise Sean O'Malley. I hate to do it, but that guy pivots with his jab. He is always testing that center line and trying to open up the opponent's stance, and that is the movement with which he evades. 
unless he is forced into a full on retreat, which because of that, it's just much harder to do that to O'Malley than it is to most MMA fighters. He does not. He has a zero sum understanding of evasive footwork, which is that I have to be doing something which is offensively meaningful at the same time that I am being defensive. Um, yeah. And, and Gary, Gary showed that he, he doesn't really have that or, uh, yeah, he's, like I said, he's capable. It's, it's a small technical adjustment. Uh, and it all, as far as I see it, really just comes down to keeping that jab online. Um, but he, he didn't show that he either knows how to do that yet or understands that. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, you said earlier, this is, I suppose, what you get when uh, all of your opponents are so perfectly chosen for this particular moment in your progression as a contender. Uh, if you don't blow them out of the water, it, it feels really disappointing. <laughs> it's, you set high expectations given that for every single one of your fights, Mr. Gary, we have been saying... Uh, boy, this is a smart pick for an opponent. <laughs> there's, there's a high expectation that you will cruise to victory. And that, that simply didn't happen here. And if this was the Wonder Boy approach, I have to say it was a, and this is not a comment on the Irish nation, but this is a, a pale imitation of Stephen Wonder Boy's Wonder Boy, if you will. A, a pale and ginger imitation of Stephen, <laughs> Stephen Thompson's approach. Um, I mean, but it was interesting, as you said. Like, yeah, yeah. Again, I don't think I gave Neil a, a round here, but it was all sort of close and ugly. And it was interesting that we've seen now seen like a genuine limitation to sort of protean approach that Gary can take to his striking. Yeah. That. Uh, yeah, sometimes he's going to stuff, try stuff, and he's just not going to be very good at it. That will be more. Uh, that will be interesting when he comes up against genuinely stuffed star ma- tough star matchups. I mean, I think he's sort of reached the end of the line uh, as far as uh, easily solvable, manageable matchups go. He's, he's not going to get any anything like that this point on i mean he called out of course he called out colby covington of all people after the fight another despicably intelligent call out because there's obviously some heat to be had between two intensely annoying people uh and at the same time ian gary knows (laughs) don't be fooled he's not asking for the fight because he thinks it's going to be tough he th- no. he knows as we do. The Colby Covington has looked shook, looked like absolute shit for three years now, uh, and looked worse than ever in his last fight. That's why Ian Gary called him out. I mean, I finally was like, I was mad at him when he said that. I was like, I fuck you, Ian. <laughs> you don't get to fight Colby now. Now you have to fight somebody good. But who knows? Maybe he'll get Colby. He'll get to keep this cultivated win streak going one fight more. But. Very soon, he's gonna have to fight like a Shavkat or something. There ain't, ain't much road left. No, he's running out, running out of track. So I look forward to seeing that because I would, I would like to see Gary uh, meet that challenge. I would like to see him step up to the level of his competition. But um, this was a helpful reminder that that may be a a fainter hope than I would like. Uh, and, um, yeah, also like another part of me would also like to see Gary fail because he is pretty annoying <laughs> to be fair. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't hate him the way the most deranged people do, but, uh, for me, it's more of the strategic approach to his career that I find increasingly vexing. I'm like, all right, you know. The fact that it's, it's the fact that he keeps doing it and it keeps working. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it, very smart. I gotta give him props at the same time that I'm sort of side eyeing mm. him, you know? Yeah, okay, good job. Yeah, yeah. calling oh. out Colby Covington despicable. Come like Ilya Victoria being like, I don't want to fight any of these contenders <laughs> in my division. I want to fight Conor McGregor. Yeah, true. <laughs> Ilya Victoria is saying that, I believe, by the way, in the same breath as he was saying that, um, 
he they're all washed up and their time's passed. Exactly, yeah. That he didn't want to fight Volkanovsky again because it's time for the new breed. P.S. I want to fight Conor McGregor, who just did a movie. Yes. <laughs> who hasn't fought in... If it ever happened, it would be it's in Conor McGregor as a perfect cube of void <laughs> muscle and plastic surgery. Yeah. A, a light smooth, heavyweight. A smooth cube. With a with a tiger tattoo, uh, yeah. I mean, fortunately, I think that is not going to happen. <laughs> in in Taporia's case, I don't think Connor's ever going to fight again. Um, if he does, it's not going to be. I mean, I don't know. Connor is a uh, a greatness chaser, but I think he might be past the point of anything except like showcase money fights. Oh yeah, he's never, never, never. He would never accept that. <laughs> right? Why, why would he? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Absolutely insane. But yeah, Ian Gary, you know, don't give this guy Colby Covington, please. I know the temptation is strong. UFC, you're like these are two of the worst people I've ever spoken to. Let's have them fight, but don't do it. It means nothing. And Gary has he's run out of rope. He doesn't get another one of those. He's got to fight. I don't know. I mean, who else is there? Let's look at the welterweight rankings. He's got to fight Shavkat or Gilbert Burns. Maybe Sean Brady, you know, is a lateral move, but a different kind of test. Basically, he's got to yeah. fight a grappler. You know, the time has come. You want to be a contender? He doesn't, he doesn't, he's no longer with Huff, right? He can fight Burns. That should be fine. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure, is he? He didn't. I don't think he had Huff in his corner for this event. Hey, well, maybe they, like kicked him out or something because he was being too much. Of a oh, diva. that's right. You know what? Maybe that is all. Maybe that he is. Respects an... women too much. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't evil enough for Team Evil. Um, that is the thing with Team Evil. All evil, but none of them are really annoying. <laughs> and that's what's really important. <laughs> you got you got to hand it to them. As long as they weren't beating up a woman in front of your eyes, you'd much rather mm-hmm. have a beer with anybody from the Black Zillions team than you would Ian Gary, who probably drinks what I believe over there you call Alco Pops. Uh, um, UKD for that man. Yeah. Um. Maybe by the way, that is another element here that. When he fought like Gabe Green, which I thought was a much better anti-pressure performance, he was with Henry Hooft. Mm. And that was a lot more of a stable, keep your footing, small steps, use the jab and counter down the middle. That was a fundamentally solid performance. This one, not so much. Much broader strokes and missing a lot of the finer points that uh, I usually associate with people who are actively training under the very strict... Henry Hooft. He makes people fight point. the right way. And maybe that's Gary has lost a bit of that because he no longer has Hooft in his corner. Could be. Cool. All right. Let's take another break then. Last one of the show. When we come back, we have uh, Mirab, Duwalish, Willie, Henry Cejudo, and Fluffy Hernandez, Roman Kopolov. That one should be short. We're going to talk about those after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support Heavy Hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are, but no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve, so thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. Marab Duwalish Willie, Henry Cejudo. Um, I still don't feel, Phil, that I, like, get Henry Cejudo. Huh? He's um he's obviously great. Uh he is obviously has more potential for greatness than he has results of greatness overall. Uh Kyle McLaughlin, who uh you know loves talking about pound for pound rankings. It is insane to me that he's been having these arguments as long as he has and he hasn't tired of them as I have. 
But he he was saying that he thinks Cejudo is probably a you know top forty, top thirty uh, MMA fighter of all time, which I think sounds about right. That basically means he's he's clearly great. He's got some really big tent pole kind of wins, uh, and then otherwise it's just a lot of what could have been is all you can really say. But uh, I still, I mean, how do you fit this performance? into the rest of Cejudo's very weird and broken up career. Like how, where does this fit? What, what, what's the story of Henry Cejudo that, that this new chapter has, uh, has revealed to us. I, I don't, I still feel I don't really know other than he looked like maybe he got old. Yeah. I mean, it's either that he got old or that his arm got busted by a devilish really kick mm. or that, He's just never fought anyone like Marab Devalishvili before because no one's ever fought anyone like Marab Devalishvili before. Yeah. That being said, uh, so, uh, yeah, go on, go on. I mean, just like very difficult to say. I mean, we've seen Hudo uh, lose stretches of fights. We've seen him uh, probably, you know, win a robbery against DJ. Yeah. We've never seen. We've never seen this. No, no. But once again, We've never seen him get just shoved out out of a fight. But once again, uh, in the first round, I had the feeling of, oh my god, Cejudo is is yet again surprising my by by just like really getting the matchup. Hmm? Oh my god, he's going to do it again. A guy who about whom all I can say is that. I he's changed and taken so many strategies throughout his career that I'm just not entirely sure like what kind of fighter he is. I don't know how to categorize his his game. And 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 yet I thought I was watching him just be surprisingly good at anything he sets his mind to yet again. Uh but part of that it has to be said was connected to our theme of UFC 298. Because I got to say, what was Marab's plan at the start of this fight? Did he what think... Was Marab's plan against, like, John Dodson? Yeah. Oh. This was one of those performances, though. Like, it's a worrying realization that uh, his team seems to think that this is, like, one of the good, <laughs> the good ways for Marab to fight. Is to, like, go on the back foot and be kicky man. Mm-hmm. And he's really very awkward at that. Like the individual techniques of basically every part of Marab's game, ex- except the, the the takedowns and the mat wrestling, are are not good. His striking fundamentals are not sound. It's the pace that makes him effective. And it honestly troubled me that this was not the first time we have seen Marab appear not to understand how important pace is to his winning chances. Because he he had to change that approach in order to start winning the fight. It was not working to start with. I think, yeah, we've we've seen a lot of kind of uh, empty volume from Marab in some of those fights, like the uh, Aldo fight and... The Dodson fight, where yeah, he's just skirting the outside and he's just doing stuff in the most. As, as we said in like the the Aldo fight, it's like the the most Ursat version of the uh, Volkanovski approach. Yeah, it's just like I'm gonna land some light volume and then I'm gonna clinch and stall. Leaf and... leaf blower Volkanovski. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, with this one, I mean, I don't know. Maybe they just thought that they needed to get out of the first round and not commit to too much against Cejudo. He's a big, powerful counterpuncher. When he has finished people, it has been early. Um, obviously did have a bead on on Marab because he did hurt him in the first round. Mm-hmm. With basically the exact um, same counter combination that Marlon Marais got him with. I think it was a right hand to the body, left hook upstairs or something like that. That left hook, man, that is the uh, poison punch for old Marab, it seems. Yeah, it'd be really interesting to go back to his fight with uh, 
is it like old dude but beat him back in the day who do you lose to frankie signs or somebody frankie signs yeah I wonder how many clinch break left hooks there are in that fight because uh, frankie was a yeah. good transitional fighter yeah uh, well, we should go back and rewatch that before Marab fights again. I would guess probably a lot of left hooks on the break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, but yeah, I mean that makes in 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 that way it makes it all the more impressive. Yeah, he he had like basically he had a fairly empty first half of the first round. He flapped and he around. Got hurt and they got into lots of grappling exchanges, and and the pace went up sort of by default. And he was getting and then, beautifully out wrestled on the mat by Cejudo. Cejudo on top. Yeah, you were like, "Oh, this is an Olympic wrestler." <laughs> his yes. his riding, his leg ride. Marab went for like a grand B roll at one point, and it looked yeah. like when Nick Diaz kept trying to roll for leg locks on GSP. Yes, he's like, "I'm just gonna put this arm over your butt and just stop that." Okay, you're done. Just he made Marab look like a kid on the ground, and. uh yeah, and then Marab decided he would do the thing he does that wins fights and instantly started winning in round two. The turnaround was so sudden and so complete, I almost couldn't believe it. Because, again, I was like, oh, shit, Henry Cejudo is, act- once again, much better than I think. He's going to win. And the wheels just fell off so fast. Yeah. I mean, again, I'm, I'm just not sure that Cejudo has been ever been in there with someone who can physically bully him. <laughs> no, I mean, literally the last guy who put that kind of aggression and pace on him was the first fight against Demetrius Johnson. Yeah. Makes you wonder how much of that robbery was down to Demetrius not just doing exactly what he did the first time. Don't move around and low kick. Bully him. It seems like it works. Um, yeah. But once again, Marab just remains... My God. I'm just a phenomenon. Yeah. Like, I cannot get over this man. And I, I mentioned this before, but I, I did, I do still remember the, like, the press conference where him and Ilya were, were shouting each other out. And it's one of the most charming things you'll see. What what happened? Uh, Remind me. I think, it's, I think it's Ilya being, he's being interviewed by a bunch of people. And then uh, Marab, uh, like, grabs a mic and he's like, let me tell you, brother, you're going to be champion. Every time I <laughs> let me tell you guys, every time I train with this guy, he knocks me down. Uh, he's the best. He's gonna, and then like Ilya's just like, no, my brother, you're going to be champion. You're the best. <laughs> and then like they're just hyping each other so up so much. It was great. Little Georgian solidarity there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they obviously both, you know, genuinely did think the other guy was was very good. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, yeah, like Marab was just like, yeah, this guy knocks me down all the time. Like he's so good, he's gonna be champion for sure. Um, and they were both right. Yeah, I mean, Marab looks like champion and waiting again. No one has done that to Henry Cejudo. No, especially not even after starting badly. And he's just like, no, I'm gonna win now. It's gonna it's gonna overpower the most like one of the most physically dominant fighters uh, that like of. In both flyweight and bantamweight. Yeah. I'm just going to show you what the, what the, the how stark the contrast was. This doesn't paint the whole picture. These are just numbers. But the stats, uh, in round one, Marab threw 32 strikes, very low for him, and attempted two takedowns. And he lost that round, got if not knocked down, then badly hurt and got out wrestled, got controlled for almost two minutes. Round two, he threw 78 strikes and went for four takedowns. Round three, he threw 62 and went for five takedowns. So it really is uh, a not a Marab fight or not one of the good kind. And then it becomes the, the good kind of Marab fight. And, um, it doesn't seem all that surprising that he was just so much less effective when he was doing the other thing. And this is why I say it's a theme, because even after that round, he'd gotten hurt. He went back to his corner and they told him to either be smart or to be safe. And when I hear that from a corner, I think it means effectively what he was trying to do in round one. Mm-hmm. Uh Oh, this guy's dangerous. Let's stay away from him. 
Let's not encourage him. Let's not accept his terms that we should have a fight with him. Let's just try to keep him at bay. And boy, am I glad that Marab, uh, willfully or not, ended up ignoring that advice. If that was indeed what they were trying to get him to do, because it was the forward pressure and the pace and the variety so clearly that won him this fight. And once it got rolling, he just gassed Cejudo out and just started crushing him. So, uh, MMA corners, stop thinking that it's smart to give away control of the fight. That is neither smart nor safe. Particularly if your fighter has yeah, one of the greatest pace, well, the greatest pace as a weapon like, yeah. that we've ever seen in MMA. The, the clearest cardio advantage we have ever seen. Um, that is just demoralizing to deal with. He should probably go out there and make everybody deal with it as often as possible and as quickly as possible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sean O'Malley does not sound infused about the prospect of fighting Marab Tavalashvili. Why would he? Yeah. I don't even think it's actually at all impossible that Sean O'Malley nukes Marab. Oh, yeah. That's (laughs) got perhaps the best single chance of doing it. He's super hittable. He's not incredibly durable uh and o'malley is short yeah o'malley's big and lanky and a absolute knockout punching sharpshooter he could wreck marab but if he doesn't it seems like a nightmare like who wants Uh, to i think i I heard o'malley saying that he'd much you know he'd rather fight tapuria because tapuria is a scarier fight and i was thinking Mm -hmm. sort of is in a way it's scary in the you know house money kind of way. Yeah. Because if you get knocked out by Ilya Tapuria, people will be like, oh yeah, you know, well, he went up a weight class, uh, you know, huge punch and all that, and it'll be a cool it'll be a cool boxing match, and you know, maybe you get if you get KO'd by Tapuria like that. But if you lose to Marab, you are going to look like shit. Yeah. It is, it's scarier it's in a... a tiny man carrying you around the octagon on his shoulder talking to Mark Zuckerberg or whatever. Yeah. It's, it's Tapori is scarier in a much more palatable way. Like, yeah. it's sort of like fighting Tapori would be like for a Mali, like signing up to go off to war and getting shot to pieces. Yeah, exactly. Whereas signing up to fight Marab would be like agreeing from the outset that you're going to work at the same company for 30 years and then die of cancer unfulfilled. <laughs> <laughs> like <laughs> the, you know, both equally scary. If you take a, if you take a substantial step back, one way more depressing and not as cool. Uh, yeah. Who would want to lose to Marab knowing what it looks like when he beats people? It looks like a miserable experience. At least Taporia has the decency to put you to sleep. But uh, we need to see that fight. I mean, come on. And I think yes, I do not need to see. I do not need to see Sean O'Malley against Ilya Taboria. No, let that down the line. You know, if they're still around, they're still champions. If O'Malley has to move up, I'd be happy. To, it sounds like a really cool style matchup. I'd be very happy yeah. to see it. But don't log jam these goddamn divisions. We need get the get the wheels rolling again. Get get contenders in here. Let these champs start clearing things out if they can. Okay, final fight of the card, or rather, first fight of the main card. Fluffy Hernandez, Roman Kopolov. I think we saw this coming. Yeah. Because we like Roman. Obviously, his game is so cool. And he did some cool shit in this fight. But uh, he's, uh, as I as I dubbed him on Twitter in an in a incredibly unpopular tweet, <laughs> <laughs> I said, Rumble Johnson, Michael Johnson, and now Roman the new Johnson Kapalov, which is what I will be insisting <laughs> on calling him going forward. Nobody liked it then. They're not going to like it now. But boy, is this man a Russian Johnson. He's, yep. he's got he's got that thing really reminded me of, of Rumble when he got taken down and both immediately, but somehow very slowly gave up his back. Uh and had that thing where he just like kept fighting to stand, even as the guy on his back was getting closer and closer to choking him out. He just like, wasn't yep. aware 
of the danger or was too panicked about getting back up to address it. That's a very Michael Johnson or very Rumble Johnson thing that he has. Yeah, the man is just not a good or comfortable grappler. No. And I mean this is this has surely gotta be the lock for the uh Michael Johnson yes. versus uh the hell is it? The, the uh, Darren Elkins. Yes. Uh predictable fight outcome of the year. One hundred percent. Fluffy getting absolutely smoked. Until well, I've got ran back into the cage, inevitably ran back into the cage, and yeah. then, uh, to be fair, did a much better job of stopping takedowns than I remember him doing. And they, mm-hmm. they had some weird stat where he's, he's stopped like twenty loads of takedowns. They said like twenty takedowns in a row. Yeah, and I was like, oh, it does make sense considering that he's been fighting <laughs> strikers who have presumably been getting utterly toasted and then have been like, oh, shit. And then, <laughs> yeah. and then shot on him. And yeah. he just shrugged it off. Yeah, because then if you go back before those 20 takedowns he stopped in a row, you get two fights in which he is just getting taken down and losing because of it. Um, yeah, I mean, because that is the the rumble and... A Michael Johnson thing to a T is that yes, yes, we're actually very good at stopping takedowns. But once one of them worked, it's over. They absolutely, and, and frankly, before that, Melvin Guillard, once once one worked, they yep. just absolutely exploded. Yep. Uh, yeah, it wasn't entire. It wasn't just the grappling eater um, that was at fault for Kopolov here. It's also um, he's he's he was obviously so much better a uh, technical striker. Than uh, than Fluffy, uh, and even when he was getting run around, he was sneaking in some really nasty looking shots, some some kicks to the body, mm-hmm. some beautiful uppercuts and hooks off the backhand to the body. Um, all great ideas, good anti wrestler practice, also just kind of the stuff that Kapalov likes to do. But uh, equally at fault as his terrible reaction to. Uh, his, his his psychological collapse when the out grappling starts to happen is the fact that he doesn't really have great evasive footwork either. So once again, fitting into the theme of our card, this is a habitual problem for Kopolov though. Um, he really resets in a passive way where it's pretty clear he's just trying to reset and if you're a guy like Fluffy Hernandez, it is nothing if not an invitation, even a demand, that you just run after him faster. Because it's clear he, when he starts moving, he's no longer in position to land those devastating strikes. And uh, combined with the threat of the takedown, that meant that Anthony Hernandez, a far messier kickboxer, was repeatedly able to just barge forward and throw like four right hands in a row. And they would land, or at least cause Kopolov to stumble, and his back would hit the fence, and that was sort of the start of the uh, the start of the downfall, the pressure before the takedowns. I mean, it's just one of those inevitable things. I think he did a he did a, a better job than I was expecting mm-hmm. of holding his ground and intercepting Fluffy, and even fighting off the takedowns. Uh, it's just the the matter is he just doesn't have the style you know he he has to stop every single takedown he has to kill people before they before they get one yeah it's just not going to work against someone like fluffy and without the without the threat of those takedowns um tricking him into fighting it in a really passive way that lets the other guy take control of the fight which will inevitably then lead to them getting the takedowns he's trying to avoid yeah, there, mm-hmm. it does. It looks like there's hope for Kopolov to figure out to shore up yeah. this part of his game, for sure. But that's uh, that's the way Fluffy Hernandez beats people, and and it is also the way Kopolov tends to lose. So nothing too surprising about that. But yeah, and get get Fluffy into uh, like some some relevant fights. Contention, man. It's time for sure. I mean, if you kind of just blow. Uh, you know, apex cards on middleweights for whatever reason because you love them now. Just put put. If I have to see someone in them, yeah, put Fluffy in there. Let's do uh, a Fluffy versus um, 
Oh, wait, did he already fight Hermanson? No, I don't think so. Let's do that. Yeah. Hermanson just won a fight. Uh, fluffy, they, they'll enjoy grappling with each other. There will be some cool headlocks from both guys. Two guys, in fact, who have gotten that, like, uh, that, um, I don't know how you call it, the, uh, the guillotine arm triangle, the, the Schultz headlock, the full arm through yeah. guillotine. Uh, both mm-hmm. of them like that very cool move. Both of them use it to get to the back. I'd love to see them grapple with each other. Let's yeah. do it. Apex, here we come. Yeah. All right. Well, that's it for this week's episode of Heavy Hands. As always, you can find us on the social media, Twitter at Evil Greg Jackson. That's Phil at Boxing Bush. That's me. If you care uh, to to go to the significantly quieter blue sky, you can find me over there at uh, King Typo something something. Uh, just search that. You'll find me. And, um, yeah, we obviously did not address our upcoming card on this week's episode. Um, It's a bit spotty, but it has some obvious highlights. We will have a good time breaking them down without even any need to embarrass ourselves by having to admit that we called them incorrectly. Uh, Those fights are uh, Brandon Moreno, Brandon Royval, two. Yaya Rodriguez, Brian Ortega, two. Did they? Sort of two. Was that the injury fight? Yep, that was the one where it was the armbar that everyone debated over whether it right, could actually right, right. be counted as a right, right, injury right. TK or a submission. Uh, we've got Yasmin Haurigi versus Sam Hughes. That's a cool fight. Um, yeah. Claudio Poyas is back. Guard pulling <laughs> is back, baby. <laughs> uh, Daniel Zellhuber is fighting. It, it's it's a, It's got some cool stuff, particularly if you're, uh, you know, you're into the, the obvious Mexican theme of the card. Um, but we'll talk about that to you next week. And until then, if you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. Peace.